tables. We have a couple more form controls to look at. And I'll add those to the example that we were working on. And then we're going to look at uh, HTML5 form controls. There's a lot of nice additions to HTML5, but there's some catches with them. So we want to make sure that we understand what the catches are. So let's, let me download the example from last time, and then we can add to it. Okay, if we look at the example we had last time, we had an example of text boxes, drop downs, radio buttons. All right, and then we had our submit button. We talked a little bit about styling this form. Let me open that up and edit it. So we can see the code. And a few comments about the code before we go and polish up the last few form controls. All right, first of all, remember the use of the label. The label is what the text that explains what the form field is to the form control itself. Um, that's an important accessibility consideration because people that can see base their knowledge that this is a name text, uh, this text box is for name based on the proximity of the label to the text box. Well, if someone's accessing, accessing this from a screen reader, they're tabbing through these controls. They can't see the words next to it. So the link to link the table to the ID of the form control, so the for attribute of the label matches the ID of the form control, um, allows people accessing with the screen reader to, to understand what's going on. Every form control is going to have a name and an, I, uh, and an ID. It uses the ID for purposes of the label that we just talked about. The name is what the script needs to see, the server-side script on the other end. Remember, the whole point of creating a form is you're creating a form to send some data to a server-side script to be processed. And you need to identify what those things are because that's going to come across on the query string. And you need to give a name to the field so that the server knows what, what means what what piece of data means what. Um, usually, you would be writing both, the server-side and the, 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 the form, the server-side script and the form. So you would know what you called things 
But in some cases, like the case of where we used um, the Bing or the Google search engine, someone else wrote that, in which case we had to do a little bit of reverse engineering to figure out what we needed to call things on the query string. Drop downs, again, have a, are done with a select, not an input tag. They also have a name and a ID. And each dropdown consists of a number of options. Again, the whole reason you use a dropdown is you want to limit the user to certain options. You don't want them to be able to um, simply, um, simply freeform type anything in. So you limit their choices to a number of options. Notice associated with each option, there's a value, and then there's sort of a description of what that option means that lives between the start and end option tag. The value is what the server-side script is going to see. So again, if you're tying this to a database or whatever, this might be whatever the server-side script needs to identify this as CISS. So it might be a code or an ID number or anything like that. Whereas between the start and end option tag, we put something that's easy for the user to understand. So while the user might not know what CISS means, um, they should understand what computer information systems mean. All right. Likewise with electrical engineering and accounting. So you have sort of the value, that's what the script's going to see, and then you have the um, actual uh, description of the text. Another good example would be if you're doing a search, um, you know, if, you, if you're doing a search for, um, you know, um, what, uh, what professor, you know, you're, you're searching for a, a professor's office hours, let's say, and there might be a drop down that contains a list of all the professors. Well, you wouldn't know what my employee ID is, right? I mean, I barely remember it, so I can imagine that you wouldn't remember it. Um, yet, that's what the database is going to need to pull up my information, is my employee ID. So that would typically be the value of the option, but what you would need to see would be something descriptive, so like my name. So that would be between the start and end option tag. Dropdowns are fairly similar. All right. One considerate, I'm sorry, not drop downs, um, radio buttons are fairly similar in that they have, they allow you to choose between a multiple um, predefined values so that you can't freeform type anything in. Now, each radio button would have its own label. All right which is a little different than the drop-down because the drop-down, the drop-down as a whole has a label. Here, each option has its own label. Because of this, we make the name and the ID different for radio buttons. For all the other ones, I think we've made them different as well, but we could have made them the same thing. But for radio buttons, you need the name and ID to be different. The name, again, is what the script is expecting. So if it's expecting the major in a field called RB major, then we make the name of all the radio buttons RB major. The name is what ties together the set of separate radio buttons and makes them work as a unit. So, for example, in this case, all three of these have a, a name of RB major, which means that I can only click on one of them. And if I click on one, it unclicks, it unchecks the other ones. That only works because I've made the name for all the radio buttons the same. That's what ties them together as a unit. They each have their own ID because I have to associate my label with a specific radio button. So I have to give an, an ID for RB, CISS, and so on down the line. Finally, we have our submit button that has a value, which is a label, and that also gets sent to the uh, server just in case um, the server needs to know which button got pressed. And then finally, it's a type equals submit. Okay. Um, 
Now, what else do we have? We have checkboxes, and we have um, text areas. Checkbox is similar to a radio button that either has a yes or no, but instead of having a yes or no, it's either checked or unchecked. So, I could do something like this. You know how a lot of times when you register for a site, there's a checkbox that says, do you want to be emailed for updated information? And we could go in and type equals checkbox, name equals db email. We'll add an ID to this because we did that on the others. Then we need to specify a value, or rather we can specify a value. If we don't, I believe it defaults to uh, Y, or I'm not sure what it defaults to, but it, there is a default if we don't. But I can give it a value. And again, that's what the script is expecting if this is checked. So now we have this, and email me with updated information. You can either check it or not. That's different than these radio buttons. Once these radio buttons are checked, you can't uncheck them. You can only check another one. Whereas this is a yes or no question. And each checkbox is going to be independent, which means that if I had a, another checkbox that says email me with uh, information from my uh, business partners, all right, a different checkbox. Then you would, um, the, the two radio buttons would work independently. So you could check both of them, you could check neither of them, you could check one but not the other, and, and all that would be okay. So, the difference between the two between a radio button and a check button, again, is the radio buttons are mutually exclusive when you give them the same name and put them in a group, which means that you can pick one, but you can't pick multiple, whereas checkboxes, each checkbox operates independently. So, for example, here, major, I have where you can only pick one of these three. But if I wanted to make it so that Maybe instead of major, it says, check the things that you are interested in. Well, it's possible for you to be interested in computer information systems and electrical engineering. So you would use check boxes for that. Now, which would you use, a drop-down versus a radio button? A lot of it has to do with how much space you have. Notice here, the radio buttons end up taking a lot up more space than the drop-down. But the advantage with the radio buttons is you can see everything all in one shot. All right. Next we're going to do a text area. And a text area is like a text box in that it's free form. You can type anything in, but it's multiple lines.
You could put something here that says put comments here if you wanted to, and that would be the default value. I think. So there's our text area, which we can type multiple rows in if we want to. Now, can we size that text area? Absolutely. And we can size it through the CSS. There we can give a, a size to it. Let's go just for laughs and put. Like that. And then that pre-populates it if you want to do that. I'm not sure if that's a good idea or not, but you can do it. All right, those are the basic form controls that have been around prior to HTML5. Actually, there's a couple of other ones. Um, there is a password control, which is like a text box, except it does not display what you typed in. So for example, let's pretend for a, for a second that, this, that the email is a password. If I say type equals password, then if I type something in, it doesn't show it. All right? So that's another one. There's two other kinds of buttons. One is to reset the form and set everything back to the defaults. That's typically not a good idea to use. Because a concern is, is what if you click the wrong button? Then you've wiped out everything you've entered in. And let me show you a great example of that. If I can find it quickly. Um, all right, let's go and browse the schedule. All right, I'm searching for spring 2016. And I have all this criteria here. So let's say I think very carefully about my schedule. I definitely don't want to be here before 9 a.m. So I'll say the meeting time is greater than 9 a.m. I don't really care when it ends because I'm a night owl. All right? Include only these days. I sure don't want a weekend class, so we only include Monday through Thursday. Instructor's last name begins with. I've heard everyone rave about how good Zeller's is. So I'm going to put Z-E-L-L because -L, I'm not sure if it's A-R-S or E-R-S or what. Now, here's the interesting thing, that they give you a option to make sure, uh, to, to match that name, but they, they don't give you the option to exclude instructors whose name matches that. So you can come to that, con you can come to whatever conclusion you want to on that. And let's see, I would like it to be just, a one credit hour course because I need one credit hour to, um, you know, to, to make my financial aid requirements. So I come down all here after I painstakingly enter all those in. Let me go do a search. Oh look, I'll click this button. All right. And what does it do? It resets everything back to the defaults. It doesn't do the search. All right. Horrible design in my case. Let's count all since this is horrible. All right. Number one, which is the bigger of the two buttons? The clear button. 
which is the first of the two buttons, the clear button. About the only thing they got close to being right is they made the search button green, and green sort of means go. Uh, can't see that difference between the two, or they both look gray, and, and you've lost that meaning. Clear button there, all right. Someone is going to hurt someone than not. So, do the clear button to you by showing you this example, and I'm never ever going to talk about it again. So, if you have other classes with me, I'm going to pretend that it doesn't exist because you can all you is almost never really useful. All right. There's a different kind of button that is useful that we'll talk about when we talk about JavaScript. All right, that's not a clear button or a submit button. And we'll talk about that when we get to JavaScript. There's one more thing I forgot about forms, and that is a field set. A field set simply allows you to put, the for, uh, put some of the form fields in like a little um, grouping. So I could say field set. Maybe the first things I lump, first three things I lump together as personal information. And then the last several things, academic information. So I can group those things together. And I can give a caption. And right this second, I got very insecure about if that's the right tag or not. So I'm going to Google it. Ah, see, it's legend, not caption. Glad I did that. And then this group of fields we'll call academic info. And what that does is this. It simply allows us to put, by default, show the link. like that. And um, it puts like a border around it by default. And of course, we can style that to be different if we want it to. Now, notice that it put bullet points next to that. And the reason for that is, I forgot the UL tag on the second part of the list. I forgot to close and start the UL. Now, the one thing that I talked about a little bit last time, and I'm not sure how much I've emphasized it prior to this, I'm sure it's covered in the book, is about giving styles to classes and giving styles to um, IDs. Remember most of our coding, and again, HTML5 really sort of eliminated the need for us to use IDs that much. All right, because now we have specific HTML tags for navigation and header and so on. But I can give, in addition to the HTML tag, I can give 
something a style either by putting a pound sign from it and using the ID so that would be pound sign submit so that means the things that have an ID of submit I'm sorry button submit no an ID of submit ah the LI has the ID of submit right we can go in and um, we can um, give them a certain style role. So in this case, I text the line center. I could give things of a certain class and make it. So for example, these ID or these LIs, I'm going to say class equals major. And I'm going to do the same thing on the radio buttons. And then I can assign a different style for everything that has a class of major. And to make it obvious, I'll say background. And those then look different. So when do you use one versus the other? Remember a class is when there's more than one thing on the page that you want to give a certain style to. And again, group it together based on things that like represent the same thing. The example I gave last time I think was if you're a pharmaceutical company and you had warnings, you might create a warnings class. And then put every paragraph that was a warning, give it a class of warning. And then you could style so all of your warnings throughout the entire site would look the same way. That's a pretty fundamental design principle, is that similar things should look similar. Things that mean the same thing should look about the same. So you're sort of teaching the user if, for example, I put a border and italics for every one of my safety warnings on uh, prescription medication. Then the user, after they see that a couple times, is going to learn, gee, if I see something with a border and in italics, that means it's a warning and you can pay attention to it. An ID is just like a class, again, the difference being that with an ID you're referring to only one element. All right. Now again, HTML5 with the different tags that they've introduced has sort of made the uh, need of these things um, a little less, but they're still available to you if you want to use them. All right, HTML5 controls. I have that opened up over here. They review some of the ones that we did before. I think at the bottom of the page, here we go. We can be more specific with our HTML5. And in this case, I can specify that I want, it's not just a text box, it's a box for a number. And what's the minimum number that I can put in there? One. What's the maximum I can put in there? Five. So if I go and run this, and I put in 37 and I hit submit it tells me hey that value is not between 1 and 5 all right pretty nifty you could not do that prior to HTML5 without using JavaScript to do that sort of validation you would have to do that in JavaScript all right I mentioned there's a catch with it. And you can also guess that the catch invo involves Internet Explorer. All right. In fact, they say this. Note type does, uh, equals number is not supported in IE 9 and earlier. So let's go into IE 9. Uh, I think this is IE 9. It didn't do the validation. It accepted it. 
So what do you do in a case like that? One thing you could do is simply not use these HTML5 controls because they're not going to work in some browsers anyhow. I could see making the argument for that. What do you, how would you validate this if you were doing it? You'd have to use JavaScript, all right? Which is what you would have had to have done pre-HTML5. So to make this foolproof, what I would do is I would use the number text box and I would have redundant JavaScript that checked and made sure that the value entered in was between 1 and 5 and do that um, in order to catch the situation where the person has a version of the browser that does not support these, these types. This actually shows sort of the wisdom of the people that developed HTML and the browsers. In other words, an input tag, by default, is an input type equals text. So if you omitted the type, it would give you a text box. In addition to omitting the type, if a browser doesn't know what a type is supposed to be, like in this case, IE9 doesn't know what a type equals number is. All right? So what's it do? It treats it like a text box. In other programming languages, in other more full-bodied programming languages, if you try to use something that the language doesn't know about, it blows up and it just won't run. Here, it does what I referred to earlier as graceful degradation. All right, it's not going to implement the number control because HTML5 isn't understood by this browser. But it'll make it a text box, and at least you can work around that, right, by adding in JavaScript to do the validation. All right? So with these HTML5 controls, all of them are just different flavors of the text box. All right? Um, I believe all of them. If not all of them, then nearly all of them. And what that, the implication of that is, is if it doesn't work, on a particular browser, it reverts back and will, will work like a text box, which means at least the person can do their thing. All right? And then if you want to duplicate the validation, you can write some JavaScript. Let's see a couple other examples of this. This notice that because I've given a step, it goes up in increments if I hit the up button. And it won't let me enter something in that doesn't fit the criteria. Again, what about an HTML? What about a browser that does not support HTML5? Well, treats it just like a plain old text box. I can put anything I want into it, and it accepts it. And if I wanted to do that validation, I would have to implement that in JavaScript. Other types, a date type. I can go and pick up the date picker. And if I put something, go up, month, the day, the year. I cannot type in some garbage here. Actually, I could. I could not type in some garbage here, like letters. It's not letting me type that in. Again, how would this work on IE9? It would just treat it like a text box. It would not do any validation, and you would have to write JavaScript code to do the validation.
Here's a cool one to pick a color. Instead of having to memorize the code, you know, the hex code, you could click this and whatever your system's color picker is will come up and will allow you to pick a color that way. A range allows you to validate within a range of things. I think we've already seen that. Input type equals month means that you could only put in the month of um, associated with the date and so on down the line. Time, email, search, telephone, URL, and so on. All these are simply specialized versions of the text box. And in pre previous to HTML5, uh, a browser that does not support HTML5 will simply treat it like a text box which means that you've lost any validation and you'd have to go in and use it. Now let's consider your other option. Your other option would be uh, to forget the HTML5 controls and write it like text boxes to begin with. Well, you'd be no better off because you'd still have to write the validation, right? Because then no one would get the HTML5 control if you wrote it as using just text boxes. So. It's a good practice to use these, but sort of have a fail-safe um, of putting in your own JavaScript if the browser does not support HTML5. Any questions on any of this? Well, well, no, well keep in mind that IE9 is an old browser. This machine has not been updated in a while. Uh, if you, in fact, if you did this in lab, I don't remember, I don't have the versions memorized, but I'm pretty sure that these would work in lab. And that brings up an interesting question. How long do you support old browsers? That's a great question. And um, anytime a professor says it's a great question, it means that they, they don't have a good answer for you, right? Um, it depends on the nature of your site. If you know that people visiting your site are sort of power users, then maybe you don't support older browsers prior to a certain version. If, however, you know that your um, users are the, the general population, general public, you're going to get some stragglers that have older browsers, and, and therefore you probably would want to support them. Um, it is sort of my belief that um, you don't want to cut anyone out of the loop and therefore, you know, if I'm going to make a mistake, I'm going to make a mistake in error on the side of supporting a browser that isn't used much anymore as opposed to excluding people from accessing or using my site correctly. We could actually do a Google search. Now this, this information is sometimes tough to come by. Just the methodology is, is, is tough to get accurate information and you'll see inconsistency but we do a search for browser uses by percentage. Here's a couple of stats. Now, this doesn't differentiate between versions of Internet Explorer. And, and notice the difference here. There's a, there's a method of doing it that Stat Counter uses and a method that calls uh, by net market share. Notice that Stat Counter says about 50% of the people are using Chrome. Net market share says only a, qu only a quarter of the people, so half as many people. Internet Explorer is used by roughly 20%, 17% actually, according to Stat Counter, and over 56%. All right? So it would be interesting to see like, how these things come up with these statistics. And a lot of it deals with like, which sites are being analyzed here. All right? Um, Let's look for a more 
comprehensive. This just, this just looks by browser type. This, for example, looks at the U.S. government's websites. In other words, the U.S. government analyzes all the people accessing their site. Now, is that a representative population? I don't know. All right. Probably representative of the general public, um, but it might not apply to your particular situation. Um, This breaks it down into browser and version. So according to this, 11% of people use Microsoft Internet Explorer 8 and 6% use Microsoft Internet Explorer 9. Add those numbers together and you get around 18% of the people use a version of Internet Explorer that does not support um, HTML5 controls. 18% is a substantial portion in my mind. That's nearly a fifth. All right? It's between a sixth and a fifth. Closer to a fifth. That leads me to believe that I'm not going to leave those people out in the cold and not write JavaScript. All right, so I may use HTML5 tags on my site, and that everyone that uses a uh, other browser will uh, that supports it will get the advantage of having the HTML5 uh, control um, in the in the functionality that that provides, the ability to use a date picker, for example. However, I'll put JavaScript in to do the validation in the case of using an older browser. Now, to your question before, uh, it's not necessarily that Microsoft doesn't keep up, but a couple of factors come into play. First of all, uh, Microsoft was slower than the other ones to support HTML5. Like Google Chrome has supported it for a while, and Firefox has supported it for a while. So, but if you go back far enough, there's versions of Firefox that doesn't support um, HTML5 stuff. I'm not sure if there's any versions of Google Chrome, because Google Chrome's a more recent browser. It probably supported, um, my guess would be that it supported HTML5 right out of the box. All right. Now, the other thing I would think of is not the stereotype, but who do you suspect would be your standard Internet Explorer user. Be a person that get, buys their computer and doesn't spend a lot of time like upgrading it. All right? So if they bought a computer with Windows 7, let's say, and it came with IE8, that's probably where it's sitting at today. All right? Because they're just people that, they're, they're not into updating their stuff, and it concerns them. They don't want to change. Uh, whatever reason, all right? So my guess would be that there are older versions of Internet Explorer floating around than there are of the other ones because people that use Chrome are probably more apt to download an update of Chrome than someone that uses Internet Explorer. That's just a guess. I don't have any proof for it, but I would bet. And the fact that IE8 still has that share, um, leads me to believe that my conclusion is right. I mean, if I look here, Chrome, the top two versions of Chrome that are used are the two newest versions. The top two versions of IE are the newest version and an ancient version. <laughs> right? So that, means, that leads me to believe that if you're an IE user, a certain percentage of IE users don't upgrade. They just don't. Right, but, that, but that's, that's the facts. I mean, that's, that's the lay of the land. And we can, you know, sometimes tech people uh, look disparagingly about those peop uh, at those people, but the fact is that, you know, that's their choice. It's their machine, and, um, you know, I don't like to see, where possible, saying something like this functionality 
only works in this version. You know, it, it's your job in my mind as a web developer to take reasonable effort to make things work across platform. Now again, do keep in mind you could go to other sites and get other statistics on that. Be yeah, be afraid to upgrade or, or not completely understand it or whatever. Yeah. You could. Yeah, you could. Uh, again, that, that, that almost gets to treating, you know, doing the same techniques we do with mobile, um, where, we do, where we do browser detection, user agent detection, and do things. And that's typically done via server-side scripting um, or, or possibly client-side scripting. So you could take that approach. Or you could display a message that says, for a better experience, all right? What I would not do, though, is simply say it's not supported in this browser. Um, I, would, I, would, I would avoid, let, let's put it, let me rephrase it. I would avoid doing that. I might say something like, all features might not work, or for a better experience, or something along those lines. Proceed at your own risk, even. All right? But... I, I would not just completely block someone because they had a version. But yeah, putting in either server-side or JavaScript, um, server-side uh, code or, or uh, JavaScript to look and do user detection, user agent detection, and then doing different things based on that would be a legitimate um, way. Again, the idea is is how much, you know, how much effort do you want to make to accommodate these? The, the people that are using these older browsers, especially given that we can make some conclusions, we can come to some pretty good conclusions about the, the type of user they are in that they're not terribly tech savvy and, and so on. Now, the one thing, again, to, to reiterate, is these statistics are general statistics and they're gathered a, a bunch of different ways. It's not like someone can call the internet and say, what browser are people using? And the internet says, well, across the entire internet, 20% of people are using IE and, and so on. You get statistics based on certain sites that are visited. The one set of statistics, for example, was for everyone that was visiting government sites. The other one was everyone that was using the stat counter service. And then the other one used some other service. You could get stats on your own site, and that might give you some guidance. Again, if you're doing a very high-end, cutting-edge, graphical design website or a website for um, programmers or something like that, you might make the assumption that supporting old versions of browsers is less of a priority than if you're doing one for the general public. All right questions. We have three weeks left after today. It's amazing how like I end up at the same spot every semester with, with this material. I, I guess it's not so amazing because I've done this class a million times so um, you know I sort of know the lay of the land. But we have three weeks left and we have two topics and one issue to, to deal with. The two topics are tables, which we'll do tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, but next class, and JavaScript, which will teach you enough just to get a sense of what it is. The other issue, of course, if you want to call it that, is making sure that you, everything's okay with your project and you get that completed and done correctly and so on. So that, that's an issue that we can discuss individually in lab um, if you want. All right. We'll see you up in lab.